16 gram mushroom trip report, posted to the Shroomers subreddit by Joshua Dude three years ago. Disclaimer. This is a fairly large dose, and should not be attempted by the ill-prepared. This last Wednesday, I had the most profound and otherworldly mushroom trip of my entire life. I ate 15.76 grams in total, the largest dose I have ever taken. My last trip had been almost two months before. I typically like to space out my trips to the same day once every three to four months, but for whatever reason, I've been feeling hesitant and hadn't tripped in a long time. I've been reading lately about psychedelic shamanism and the ability for shamans to enter the so-called spirit world and communicate with spirits who share the knowledge. I've been very intrigued by the notion of it and feel as though I've had similar experiences entering this dimension before, but without any comprehension of what was actually happening. I made my usual preparations, set up my notebook, had my bong loaded so that I wouldn't have to do it later, the old ceremonial bowl of shrooms weighed out in front of me as well, all the essentials. After I'd completely consumed the bowl of cubensis, I wrote down what I wanted to accomplish for the trip, what I wanted to take away from it and such. Basically, what I wanted was to communicate with a spirit and acquire information from it to help me in everyday life and aid in my understanding of the universe and myself. I've had trips before where I'd witnessed entire lifetimes of other humans from a period in history way back, but during those trips, I only felt as if I was a bystander. I was aware of their presence, but I felt at the moment that I could not communicate nor interact with the entities or projections even if I wanted to. Although, I could absolutely feel they were there, even if they only existed in my mind. I thought that maybe if I focused hard enough, with a large dose, I could communicate directly with one of them. Luckily for me, I was not disappointed this time. It was about an hour before the mushrooms really started to take a hold of me, and right away I knew that this one would be a pretty intense ride. I usually begin my trips by focusing intently on my breath. This gives me a good point of focus that helps to ease me into the intensity and sporadic nature of the come up and peak of the trip. My very first visions were of the world falling to shambles because of what seemed like a feud for resources by our world leaders and an increasing pressure on our ecosystem. There were divergent groups of people resorting in a sort of tribalistic animosity. Our population had reached a breaking point and desperation was rampant among all classes of people the whole globe was in pain and crying out for help. It felt as though a dark sickness had been slowly spreading and contaminating the heart of global human consciousness up until the point of our destruction. But, despite the chaos, something told me that it was alright. It seemed as just a microscopic piece of time and space and that made nothing matter. I was not scared in the slightest. I knew I could defend my mind from the sickness and corruption that seemed everywhere around me. It was shortly after this that I was teleported to a completely different place mentally. I'm hesitant to say this at the risk of sounding cliche, but it felt as though my mind had completely opened and enveloped me as a whole. My individual consciousness felt separated from my physical self, and I was in what I can only rationally call the fourth dimension. It was a space unlike anything I was previously familiar with. At first, there were no forms other than an endless Fibonacci spiral, and I was soaring through it. I felt the presence of spirits and entities all around me. They existed in each strand and speck of the spiral, and this time, I sensed they were aware of my presence. At this moment, I felt completely ethereal, like an omnipresent god. I could know the inner minds and motivations of any other thing, because I was in a dimension where at the time, I believed consciousness itself to exist. Some spirits were much bigger and more present than others. Some were absolutely benevolent and peaceful, and some were greedy, selfish and evil. I sensed that these spirits were what pulled the strings behind our regular perception of reality. I tried to communicate with some of them like I'd wanted to. However, while they seemed aware of me, they also seemed too busy to stop and give me much attention. By this point, the spiral had subsided and I was in a dreamlike state. After I'd given up on trying to communicate, I felt my late grandma come to me and stay right next to me in this dark and extremely vague plane of floating geometric shapes and empty space not making a physical appearance or saying anything, but I could tell she was with me in this space. Slowly, I began to come back to my living room, and I could hear the music again. I was listening to tribal drums and flutes. The music seemed to be felt in the very core of me, and I began to dance. I danced in a circle around my living room coffee table, while the drums beat intensely, and it was truly amazing. At one point during the experience, it felt like I was suspending a giant ball of energy in the centre of the room, and that ball was just about to explode with light and spread a giant wave of positive energy throughout my whole house. But unfortunately, it never did. 
After about three hours and an intense yet pleasurable vomiting episode, my positive high energy began to turn into a blissful, relaxed state. For the rest of the night, I smoked a few bowls of marijuana and reflected on friends, family, and recent memories of my life, the trip included. I couldn't believe what had actually happened. Almost three days later, I was still in awe over it. I took a lot from that trip, and I'm very grateful for it. May you all feed the positive spirits that reside in your mind. Don't let fear, greed, self-loathing, or any other entity of corruption fill the space of your thoughts. Spread a message of love and optimism to all those you know and meet. You can be a deployer of positivity in the universe. It was spread out as well as in. Peace to you all, Joshua. Museum of Spectacles A DMT, Mushrooms and Alcohol Trip Report by Donovan Uploaded to Earwood.org June 8th, 2013 Hello, my name is Donovan, and this will be my first report regarding experiences of a psychedelic nature. Just to provide a little background regarding myself and the circumstances surrounding my encounter, I'll tell you that I am what some would call a very spiritual personality. My brother, Boob we call him, and I have been on a roller coaster ride of fantastical advancements since we read The Celestine Prophecy in 1999. He, Boob I mean, leans a little more toward the theoretical side of our sojourn, while I like to dive right into the more practical areas, which, of course, includes the use of psychedelic substances for the exploration of the psychological aspects of our perception. I had always been primarily interested in altered states of consciousness, due to their ability to so brazenly expose one to their deepest illusions and most precarious understandings, and I had experimented with LSD and psilocybin, as well as many of the more conventional substances, such as marijuana and alcohol, for quite some time to little avail. I found that THC helped to enhance my attention span and enthusiasm towards hobbies such as writing and playing video games, while the relaxing effects of alcohol allowed for me to be much more outgoing in social environments and to stop hiding my true nature from others. Hallucinogens provided a much needed and awe-inspiring vacation from the monotony of everyday life, but they'd never left me with any truly groundbreaking insights into the nature of reality, aside from revealing how dynamic and liquid my perception of it could actually become. I'd thought that my aforementioned forays into the lesser known world would have prepared me for some of the more powerful experiences available to the human psyche, but upon testing salvia for the first time, I was made briskly aware of how deeply wrong I was. What happened in that instance would change my life forever, but that is a story for another time. In this submission, I would like to make an attempt at illustrating as best I can the sheer craziness that is the DMT trip. After trying salvia a few times before reaching what I like to think of as the bottom of the universal mystery, I became very frightened of that encounter with what seemed to be the real world, if such a place exists. However, I was still very enticed by the idea of returning, only under more manageable circumstances. With salvia, I couldn't even ascertain a method of fighting to remain myself, let alone negotiate the great void to which I had been introduced, and I was hoping to find an easier way to get out of there. Meditation works to some extent, but could never take me so far, so fast, or in such a tangible and observable manner. At the same time, no other narcotics could compare to the all-consuming effects of that simple little plant. I was in a fix to be sure. After spending the past couple of years dealing with severe family-related financial problems, having little to no time or aspiration for uncovering deeper levels of understanding, I felt stunted and stifled in my quest for personal evolution. When we stumbled upon accounts of DMT and ayahuasca-induced adventures relating encounters with entities existing in a realm that seems realer than this one, I felt that we had encountered Providence, as we just so happened to know someone who actually had some DMT for sale at the time. As soon as Boob and I got back from work with our pay in pocket, I purchased myself a one-way ticket to elsewhere, thinking that if I could handle salvia at full force, then surely I would be capable of piloting the DMT vehicle without difficulty. Yet again, I would find myself deeply humbled. In order to relate my experience for what it truly was, I must first elucidate my state of mind in regard to the occasion. Throughout the course of my spiritual and psychological training, I've become deeply obsessed with the concept of an existing God figure in the universe. Now before you jump to any conclusions, let me state that my fascination has absolutely nothing to do with any religious study or kinship. In fact, Though I believe that some ideas related in the Bible and other such religious texts are especially relevant to my personal understanding, I do not, never have, and never will prescribe to any one religion, 
and maintain my personal opinion that devotion to any religion destroys one's ability to comprehend a true god to some extent, if not completely. The god figure that I speak of is simply the infinite mystery of existence. Where do we come from? Where are we going? What is our absolute situation, our ultimate truth? What is really happening here? The god that I seek is simply an ultimate comprehension of who I really am beneath the manufactured illusions of an inescapably superficial reality. The self-proclaimed realizations I had made during my encounters with Salvia were particularly frightening to me, and of course, these would inevitably colour my experience with DMT. I intended only to manoeuvre deeper into this bizarre void of consciousness, in the hope that some greater sanctity might be revealed thereat, and though I cannot be certain of the validity of my conclusions regarding the event, I do believe that just such an occurrence has transpired. Anyways, when I went to pick up the brown sugar-like pebbles from my buddy down the street, he offered me some magic mushrooms that he had left over from a little while back, and I figured that one couldn't go wrong with a price as cheap as free. Another friend of mine had left my brother and I a couple bottles of wine that he had procured from the warehouse, in which he works as a celebratory gift for me having recently acquired employment involving restorative carpentry of boob in an impossible economic environment, and we already had some extremely beautiful weed to smoke, so we're sure that this would be a weekend to remember. I have a severely addictive personality, and tend to overdo things as often as is possible. I rarely ever really regret this behaviour, but boy was I in for it this time. I decided that since we had just finished a long and arduous week of woodworking, and we were already tuckered out for the night, that I would save the mushrooms and wine for the next day, when we were well rested and did not have to work in the morning. But I could just not will myself to wait on the DMT. I had already been waiting long enough. For the price of just $10, I obtained a plastic vial containing seven rocks, resembling amber, but smelling very similar to old dust in the attic of my childhood home, each of which would be sufficient to propel an individual into the cosmos. Of course, having no grasp for the gravity of the drug that I was about to abuse, I asked Boob for a small nugget to pack as a filter, and then proceeded to cover it with three stones smashed into powder. Here we go, I say confidently to my dear brother, as I set the flame to the pipe and pulled. I had intended to hold the hit in as long as possible for maximum effect, but almost immediately, I found myself scrambling to get the smoke out before it all became too intense to endure. As soon as the smoke entered my lungs, I witnessed the objects around me tear apart from their halos, leaving neon streaks of electromagnetism hanging in the air around them, which stuck in place and then shrank as though being pulled by expansion into the vastness of space. At this point, I remembered it. Not from any experiential account that I can recall per se, but more from a primal, instinctive perspective. I knew what was happening, and all that I could say before collapsing on the floor was, Oh. The sound of my voice droned out into the rapidly shuffling distance, as a wave of electrical vapour swelled into a tsunami that came flooding in from the right of me, and all that I could do to keep from being swallowed was to drop onto my back and close my eyes in an attempt to escape the chaos that was suddenly ensuing all around me. I witnessed then, without eyes to see, the ceiling and walls of the room transform and inflate with a weightless force into an enormous dome of prisms resembling diamond eyeballs peering in at me from the edge of the world while radiating rainbow coronas in every direction. It was as though the living room had become this great museum of spectacles that had always been there just beyond my ability to perceive and had now been revealed, ephemerally, for me to partake of. I felt that though I could observe the museum from a singular point within the museum that somehow I, at the same time, am the museum. I wanted ever so desperately to exacerbate how amazing it was in vivid detail, but all that I could manage was, I can't freaking explain it, I, I don't even know what to do with myself here. And that was when the shifting began. Suddenly, everything was tumbling and folding into itself, much like what I have experienced with Salvia in the past. However, the difference is that this time, I was still me, and was able to see what was actually happening. The gravity was shifting, but not without deliberation. The very rules that make up the game of life were being rapidly changed ever so slightly by some alien persona, very concisely. It was as though the function of the existential machine depended upon the shuffling of these values. When I use the term alien, I do not mean extraterrestrial, I mean truly alien inconceivable, something entirely unknowable. Again, 
This conception is totally congruent with my experience of Salvia. However, again, this time I can actually manoeuvre. And so I move towards the edge of the dome, where I find a strange man standing in the corner, manipulating pulleys and levers, as though he's running the stage arrangement for some grand play. He works the mechanisms in the corner, while turning his gaze around to me, smiling wildly. He looks eerily similar to Two-Face from Batman, and even appears two-dimensional, like a comic book character. I think of him as being the museum's curator. I can remember thinking, this guy's obnoxious, before making my way back to the museum showroom in the centre of the dome. Upon reaching said area, I found myself standing in the living room again, effervescent clouds of colour streaming from the walls into the vastness, surrounding like a cacophony of vacuums oscillating infinitely. I could then just begin to hear disjointed ramblings approaching. It was a myriad of sounds collecting into small bunches that made up little symphonies. Each one was a different genre of music entirely, and sounded quite discordant uniquely, for altogether, the differing music created a larger orchestra, and I could just barely make out the melody. The song was beautiful beyond words, yet still, I could not stand the madness. The rules were continuing to shift, the gravity continuing to fold, and I feared, yet again, that I would be lost forever. Looking over towards the couch, I see Boob sitting straight up with his eyes fixed on me, and for the first time since the initial puff, I can feel my own eyes and how wide they are. I must have appeared positively frightening at the time. When I see him, I get the feeling that I am viewing a mirror of some kind, and I am relieved that he is present. My exact thoughts at the time were, I'm cool, that's Boob right there, that's Boob. I'm boob. I'm boob. I'm not boob. H have I been boob this whole time? And all of a sudden, I'm someone else. I have been the entire time. Then who is Donovan, I wondered. This riddle was humongous and encompassing. Everyone that I knew was in the room at this point, all going about separate businesses. I just couldn't see them if I tried to look. I could feel them though, because I was them. Residual memory, I told myself, but was my brother, so who was me? The rules continued to fluctuate, not immensely, but just enough to keep us all confused. The curator continues to meddle obnoxiously, but not without reason. I reach to my left and feel the leg of the coffee table. Suddenly, I am back in the living room again. Boob notices the change in my demeanour, and asks me if I've returned. I think so, is all I can honestly tell him. There is still a very conceivable current of electricity snaking its way throughout the room, but for all intents and purposes, I am me again, and I am lucid. I tell Boob that I think I have to vomit, and begin walking into the bathroom. Immediately upon entering, I recognise a strong feeling of nostalgia sweeping over me like excessive deja vu. I've been here before, I said to myself, and for whatever reason, it seems so very sad and desperate as if I'd been there forever. The area repeatedly assembled itself in patterns befitting its character, and I felt as though I was standing backstage at the show of all things alone. After attempting to gag myself into vomiting a few times in hopes of relieving myself somewhat, I looked into the mirror and saw that I was me, truly, and not some other person. And suddenly, I sobered. I walk into the living room and smoke a cigarette while trying to accurately relate my experience to Boob. The next morning, we ate the mushrooms with the intention of playing a two-player role-playing game while tripping. No more than half an hour in, and I was no longer cognitive. I had absolutely no idea what we were doing or what in the hell the point of any of it was. So I stopped playing and we began to watch a television show. Immediately. I recognised the embossed quality of the picture from the last time I'd ingested psilocybin, whereat myself and a good friend of mine sat here all night laughing hysterically at a British television show about survivors of an earthly holocaust rebuilding humanity on a barren planet, and I suspected that we'd experience the same type of trip as then, mild and unproductive. I was wrong. Within an hour or so, the entire room had taken on this very distant quality, like the walls of an aquarium right there, yet so far away, and the objects in my environment were floating on a tide as though the ocean had swept into the room and overtaken things. The cat was being a grouch in the corner, I was finding this all very amusing and enthusing, until 
I find myself awakening to the realization that Boob and I had been sitting here doing all of this together for ages, forever even. It was like we were the first two people in the Garden of Eden, waiting throughout eternity for each other to wake up from this crazy dream that we've been having. I felt as though he knew every intimate detail of my life, and in this nakedness, I felt ashamed and scared. I felt as though I needed to retreat. I couldn't bring myself to embrace the extreme unity of this relationship. I could not face this reconciliation, yet. I had to run away and hide in waiting. I felt so stupid that I had been doing this for so long. The whole world knew as well. Everyone that had ever been was pointing and laughing at me because I created this insane illusion to hide myself from my closest friend. A voice is telling me to get up. At first, it seems like a motivator, telling me to get up and make a better life for myself, create a better me. But then, it begins to twist and turn, seeming more like a first responder finding my body on the ground and begging me to be alright. I begin to think that maybe I really have been in some horrible accident, and this is someone trying to revive me. Get up! You have to get up! I open my eyes to find that it is indeed a person speaking to an unconscious body. On the television, that is. Damn, that was freaky, I tell Boob, who is hiding under a blanket on the couch. We both come to, and decide to take another shot at playing the video game. We run our characters in circles and stare at the clouds, laughing and exclaiming how very awesome everything looks for about 15 minutes, before throwing our controllers to the floor and laughing at them as well. I feel as if I am at the peak of something now, just close enough to reach higher, and so I suggest taking another hit of the DMT. Of course, my brother isn't into it, I think he's afraid, but I don't let that deter me, and I take a hit of what remains in the pipe from yesterday. It greatly enhances the trip, but does little else, nothing worth mentioning here at least. Later on that night, I take another hit with a very good friend of mine who cannot partake of other drugs due to enforced legal parameters and we got high together, and that was about the gist of it. It was a very fun night, but nothing exceptional beyond what I've already mentioned. At any rate, disappointed with not having returned to the fantastic museum the night before, I waited until early in the morning the next day to try one last time, as our resources had grown slim, and my brother hadn't taken his chance yet. I could remember distinctly having felt as though I were fighting the trip the first time, and that I needed to relax in order to experience it fully. It just so happened that the wine had been left over from the first night, and all seemed to be perfectly aligned. I drank the wine slowly, as I watched videos on the internet of people relating their own experiences with the drug, in order to build myself up to the moment. It was an extremely beautiful young lady that described it, to the best of her abilities, having seen angels in her visions that finally pushed me over the edge, and I packed up probably a little more than I should have. I took a long, slow drag of the pipe, and immediately, I recognised having made the same mistake again. Now, I cannot fully remember what happened here as of yet, but I can tell you that I was scared beyond my wits upon awakening from it. I recall having become a two-dimensional black and white zigzag pattern, and remaining that way for quite some time. I felt as though others were watching from somewhere, though from where exactly I could not tell, as I was existing in a two-dimensional universe. I do remember a gigantic face somewhere, a woman's face made of rainbow colours. She was watching me, and it seemed as though she had always been watching me, but I simply had not noticed until now. Though she seemed complacent, I felt as though she was happy that I had recognised her. During this episode, I lost consciousness at some point, and had very vivid dreams wherein my brother failed to relate to me his experiences with DMT several times over the course of a full week's worth of time, even though he had not even really tried it yet. After which, I awakened to my brother getting up very early in the morning, which led me to believe that I had skipped a day, and that we had to go to work immediately, which had scared me quite a bit. All in all, it was a seemingly eventless experience, but I do feel that the insights are apparent, and I am extremely grateful to have been a part of it. Until next time. received the message. A 5MEO DMT trip report by 5NEO.
posted to Irwid.org October 31st, 2017. Dosage, 40 milligrams. Irwid note, the dose described in this report is very high and potentially beyond Irwid's heavy range and could pose serious health risks or result in unwanted extreme effects. Sometimes, extremely high doses reported are errors rather than actual doses used. So before I even begin to attempt this, allow me to make a few disclaimers. One, I didn't want to write this. The idea of trying to put into words the experiences I've had with this substance is so absurd that you could only understand how absurd it is if you've been there. I know that's cliche, and a lot of what I'm going to say will be, and hard to believe also. I'm opening myself up to criticism here, and it's absolutely true, and I don't need to embellish. I couldn't have made this up. Two, the doses of which I'll be reporting on, I've since come out to find, are far too much, possibly unsafe, and I do not recommend anyone trying it. However, that reason alone is why I am writing about them. And three, when I took this medicine, I respected it. I set clear intentions and meditated before taking it. That is important and will influence the experience I have. Now, let's begin the fun part. I was in Mexico at a little gated community, where some shamanic medicine men practice that I met through what I thought at the time was mere luck. They told me about this modern to ancient medicine from the Sonoran Desert Toads and that I could meet God. I was sceptical. I wasn't an atheist, but was definitely agnostic. However, as so, the idea of meeting this big guy in the sky piqued my interest, so I agreed to give it a go. We were in a beachfront mansion, and they left me on the upper floor while the shaman went to prepare the space in the medicine. Some time later, she emerged requesting me to follow. I obliged and entered what would become a sacred space. She instructed me to set clear intentions and meditate before we began. As she wafted sage around me in the space we occupied for the moment, I spoke to the medicine. I will respect you and allow you to do with me what needs to be done. I need to reconnect with the grand creator and my own creativity. And then I meditated. I was nervous, but I'd never heard of this type of DMT before and didn't really anticipate or believe what was about to happen was even possible. Just to add a little context to what I said here, for those that don't know, uh, 5-MeO-DMT, despite being somewhat comparable in effects to DMT, is actually substantially more potent and shouldn't be confused with regular NN-DMT, despite both of them being psychedelic tryptamines. Okay, she said, and I opened my eyes to see the pipe was ready to go and about five inches from my face. There was no turning back now, and the next motions I made almost felt robotic, like I wasn't even choosing to do it. I was scared, but somehow something was moving me to the pipe. She lit a torch and held it to the pipe, and I could hear a crackle and she put it to my lips. Breathe slowly, she said, like sucking through a straw. I thought I'd gotten it all, and then, get the last little bit, she said. And so I did. I sucked one last time with all I had, filling my lungs as far as I could. I held it as she counted to ten. By this point, ten seconds in, she had to remind me to exhale. When I did, I saw fractals in the smoke, and a golden yellow haze began to fill my vision from the outside in. This happens every time I vaporise 40 milligrams. I then laid back with my head on the pillow, and instantly, blasted off. What the shaman watched was me lie motionless with my eyes closed and a smile from ear to ear for 20 minutes. What I saw was a tunnel of light and colour that whirled around me as I blasted into the great void. Within moments, the veil was lifted, and I'd popped into the anti-gravital void and was staring at a light brighter than bright. It was white if I had to put it in terms people understand, but there were other colours involved, and they were in motion. It was sort of like looking at oil on a pavement. There's a colour, but it's more than one. It's tough to describe. It's actually describing the quality of being iridescent, if you didn't know. There are colours in this that most people haven't even seen, and until you do, that seems impossible, I know. By this point, any shred of who I was had dissolved. I didn't have a name, a body, a mind, nothing. And to my knowledge, I never had. It was freeing in some sense, but I felt a desire to enter this light. Before I could, something had to destroy what was left of me. I had to die. I accepted that, and something struck me, as if I were a window pane and a bolt of electricity flicked me, and I shattered into a trillion of the most intricate fractals I've ever seen. And then, I entered it. It was love, almost. But also forgiveness, compassion, joy. Youthful, but also ancient. It was comforting and familiar. 
It was ecstasy. It was nirvana. In this place, there was no separation. It was complete unity with everything and had always been that way. This was God. And I had received that message, not through language or telepathy, but just inherently receiving the message that this was God and that this is where souls come from and return to. I also had a vision of Africa. I believe there were other visions, but I can't recall them now. I just never wanted to leave this space. And then, before I knew it, bam, I was back in the prison of my body. But now, I had the message. This world we live in is false, a construct of our own creation. And I had learnt that God is in us and we are in God, all the time. I am you and you are me and we always have been. We are the stardust and water, the mountains and the beaches. And what we see in front of our eyes is no more real than the dreams we have at night. I'm no longer afraid to die now. Death is the beginning of the real adventure. Entering the Cosmic Womb An ayahuasca trip report by East Forest Uploaded to Earwood.org July 19th, 2009 The first time I heard about ayahuasca was in a Rolling Stone article and it did not paint a pretty picture sitting blindfolded in a dark room, puking into buckets, and wearing adult diapers. I suppose in an attempt at journalistic fairness, the author talked about both the psychedelic wonders of the experience, and also the corridors of hell. I found the article terrifying. A year or so later, a close friend of mine had his own experience of the spirit vine, and upon telling me about his beautiful adventures, he continually prodded me with, when are you going to drink ayahuasca? In my mind, it wasn't soon, but now at least I had an invitation. Through my ongoing spiritual journey, I learned more about the grandmother, and after about two years of education, I decided it was time for a visit. I asked my friend if he could help arrange an upcoming session, and two months later, I found myself in an ayahuasca healing ceremony with a Peruvian shaman direct from the Amazon. I arrived at the temple about an hour or so before the ceremony was to begin. There were 20 total participants, and everyone was setting up little beds, mattress pads, blankets, pillows, personal power objects, and everyone had a small white bucket for purging into. Another first time a friend of mine accompanied me for the journey. The group was arranged in a U-shaped circle, and with not much room left, so my friend and I arranged ourselves at opposite ends of the U, with the shaman between us. Later, I discovered that my friend and I were the only two virgin ayahuasqueros of the group. I found it pleasing that the two of us ended up at the opposite anchors of the circle, and next to the shaman. The shaman spoke for about 20 or 30 minutes about what we were embarking upon. He blessed the ayahuasca, called in the four spirits, and then called us up one by one to receive our dosage. I was the last of the group to get the medicine. I was relatively calm in those final moments, but I had plenty of anxiety beforehand. I'd been preparing for this experience for a long time, with a special recommended diet of no salt, no dairy, no refined sugar, no red meat or pork, no alcohol, no sex, no drugs of any kind and also, meditation in both the morning and evening. I knelt down to receive my brew. Knowing it was my first time, the shaman asked me for a translator. Do you have experience with other psychedelics? I said yes. Are you sensitive? I said no, but haltingly. He poured a dark brown gooey liquid from one container into a thimble shot glass-like cup. He looked me in the eyes, poured a bit more from a second container, looked me in the eyes, and then poured a bit back into the container. I felt he was sensing some kind of innocence, and I trusted his dosing completely. I drank the goo, which tasted like battery acid mixed with echinacea extract. I thanked him, and sat down on my mat. We sat in silence for about 30 minutes. I was not feeling any effects beside intense anticipation. The sun had now receded, and total darkness descended upon the room. I breathed, and closed my eyes, and after 30 or 40 minutes, it had begun. I started to see geometric-like patterns. Something was happening. I heard someone purge. It was my friend. Oh no, is he okay? Here we go, I thought. The shaman began shaking a rattle and singing. The visuals rapidly increased into a multicolored, fractal, ever-changing Tron-like laser light show, moving at hyperspeed. It was amazing, but fast. Soon, I felt a buzzing of energy around me that was incredibly strong. I got very hot and uncomfortable. 
I was sweating profusely and I couldn't find relief, it was just too hot. I began to accept the fact that I would likely have to throw up. I was having a hard time with it. I reached in the darkness for my little white bucket and put it between my legs. As the buzzing grew and against the cacophony of the light show, I heard a voice, a cheerful little spirit, and it said, Okay, so we're going to do this and it won't be that bad. And after it's over with, things are just going to be great. Are you ready? I mumbled a week. Okay. The voice added, No, don't think about it too much, we'll just get it over with. Okay, here we go. And then I purged. Considering I had been fasting for the previous 24 hours, all that came up was the same ayahuasca battery acid and a little bit of water. It came out in an explosion of colours and a wild burst of energy. I heaved as much as I could, tried to clean myself up and lay back down in a fetal position with my puke bucket as my new best friend. I lay there on my side and entered hyperspace, the absolute. I immediately felt better. One of the three sitters in the room changed out my bucket. It was so strong. A muscular force that was lifting me into another dimension. I had no idea where we were going next. I just focused on my breathing. Long, slow breaths, in through the nose, out through the mouth. This was my lifeblood. My meditation practice before the journey was invaluable. Being able to continually return to my breath and release thoughts helped steer the balance of my sanity. The more I was able to breathe with total purity, without thought or judgement, the more I slipped into ecstatic enlightenment. I could feel little flittering, floating, elf-like creatures buzzing around me and pulling away layers of beauty. The music was beautiful as well, and the shaman was seemingly everywhere. Sometimes I would sing along with his songs to help regulate my breathing. I would hang on to his singing like a life preserver in a stormy ocean. His rhythm was incredible. He would sing a song and then stop for what seemed like long stretches of time when I could forget there was any music before at all. And in the pauses, there was total silence as we gently rocked in a womb of absolute being. I felt we were in a hall or pantheon of cosmic peace and wisdom, an infinite space of pure thoughtless being. All twenty of us were there together, all absolutely in the same space, all breathing together, in and out. It was incredible. A room of souls just hanging out in this timelessness, purring and utterly connected. If someone was in need, in pain or purging, we would breathe for him or her, and bring the individual back into the space. I realised that we were taking turns breathing for one another. We took turns at many tasks, looking after one another, so we could all do the work that needed to be done. I found this to be a poignant model for building community on planet Earth, each of us taking care of one another, taking turns, trading, sharing, not waiting or expecting, pure giving. Throughout the ceremony, my mind, my ego, was a masterful, clever fellow. I saw my mind as a separate sentient being, with 31 years of experience, and it would use unbelievable complex tricks to grab my attention. Any time I found myself thinking and falling down an uncomfortable void of anxiety, I would, as in meditation, return to the breath, in and out, and almost instantly the bliss returned, the cosmic knowledge returned. This is the lesson. This is your being. The never-ending back and forth from our minds to our body, from our ego to our souls, from our thoughts to our breath, it's an endless lesson in forgiveness. I was learning how to let go and surrender to what is, to the moment, absent of any punishment or perceived outcome. I felt profound forgiveness. I felt a lifetime of judgement and guilt for all my perceived shortcomings and apparent failures disintegrate into one breath. The simplicity ushered absolute peace. Just one breath, and it was all gone. At one point, I felt the voice return and it said, Do you want to know what enlightenment is? Yes, I replied. I took another slow, deep, thoughtless breath, and understood it in pure manifestation. There it is. It's as simple as that, replied the voice. And it's with you at every moment. It's all inside us. Enlightenment is as simple as letting go of your mind, letting go of attachment to yourself, to outcomes, to just letting go to the way things are. But the realisation wasn't a rejection of my ego, instead it's about embracing the false duality of our existence with compassion. The songs continued, the journey pressed on. Sometimes other people offered music. 
Much of it was transcendent. Antique guitars, chimes, solo voices, flutes, and myself with a drum. Throughout the ceremony, I sometimes wondered how long it had been, or how much longer it would continue. But such thoughts only brought discomfort, and I found them to be yet another trick of the mind. The shaman came over to me. At one point, he put his hand on my head and whispered into my ear, How are you? I'm listening to you. I'm here. I'm listening, I whispered. He blew something around me and under my shirt, and I felt as if gold rain was washing away all my fears, all menacing spirits, and I melted into surrender with bottomless gratitude. The absence of validation and judgement, with the embracing of total surrender and forgiveness for the self and others, many times being the same thing, was a critical lesson. I felt this was the ticket to the highway of eternity. Forgive myself, let go and breathe in and out. One thousand tormented lives. A Salvia Divinorum trip report at 80 times extract. My experiences with Salvia Divinorum are more extensive with that of any other substance. I would say around 100 experiences would be a safe estimate. These ego destroying trips are immensely powerful, but I will describe here the most intensely overwhelming experience I have ever had with Salvia or any other substance for that matter. After Salvia had begun to be controlled in Mississippi, I spent quite a while scouring the internet finding the cheapest, most potent Salvia I could find. I ended up buying one gram of 40 times and one gram of 80 times for a very reasonable price. The Salvia arrived in my PO box a week later. A week after I received the salvia, I had gotten curious enough of its claims to such extreme potency for the meagre price that I was charged. So, after I'd finished class for the day, I went back to my room and dug my trusty bong out of my bottom drawer. I went to the huge communal bathroom and filled a cup with water to fill my bong with. Back in my room, I cracked the back window facing the woods, filled my bong and packed the bowl with the 80x salvia. I turned on Becoming Insane by Infected Mushroom on the stereo, subwoofers booming. I knew that the synesthesia that came with the salvia trance would be greatly amplified by the music, but had I known the extreme condition I was about to enter, I may have left the music out of the equation. The techno pulsing through the room. I bent down out of the window and put my butane light as flame to the packed salvia. As the salvia started to burn, I began my first huge inhale. The blue flame of the torch incinerated the salvia at the extreme temperature necessary to get the full effect. I didn't burn up the entire bowl on the first breath, so I let a little smoke out of my nose and went right back to breathing in the rest of the plant smoke. I finished burning all of the salvia right at the beginning of my second breath. I held the smoke in my lungs and noted the peculiar and familiar taste of salvia. It was just as I was making this mental note of the plant's taste that I was snatched away from everything. This world was destroyed, not just as it exists to my perceptions, but from my memory and my understanding. This is a typical effect that salvia has to vary in quantitative and qualitative degrees. But what I was going through at this point was completely beyond the scope of anything I could comprehend or adequately explain. My ego was entirely destroyed, as were all my memories of this existence. As the salvia overtook me I had not the slightest comprehension of my surroundings, my memories, or anything associated with reality. This was as far removed from the realm of reality I had ever been and without any error, ever will be. The total loss of ego controls was beyond any possibility of self-awareness, a sensation I find hard to believe enjoyable in any aspect. Far beyond the extreme ego destruction was the sheer terror involved in this trip. 
As mentioned earlier, my reality was utterly diminished. In my dissociated state, I somehow could see my room and what was around me, but these surroundings did not register as any form of my reality. Yet my body kept on existing in it, unbeknownst to my mind. It was as if my conscious mind was completely overtaken by this new realm of insanity, and some subconscious realms of my mind kept my body aware of its surroundings, even though in my mind I had never known that physical reality. Where I was now, in this egoless eternity, I had always been, and would always exist. The first thing that happened was my body exploded into an infinite number of particles, and Aristotle had been correct. The atoms in my body could be split indefinitely, into an infinite regression of smaller and smaller pieces. My body had been split and scattered all across my new universe, but my mind remained its own entity. All the particles from my being began to be violently pulled in a circular rotation. I found myself asking, Who am I? What am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? All the questions so innate in man. I explored my existence until I arrived at my first conclusion. I was one of an infinite number of yellow buckets with no purpose unto ourselves, existing only to serve the purpose of whoever was using us. I became intensely depressed. I had no purpose, no need for a will in the first place. All my actions were predetermined by some force or entity that had no intention of ever understanding my struggles or emotions. I moved from depression to outrage and anger. My inability to control my state of existence coupled with my knowledge of my inner will conflicted with one another and was altogether painful. I asked, what is this thing that is dictating my future and my purpose? Why is it so distant? I grew to hate this omnipotent entity. Why would it give me this awareness of my will and existence yet dictate my fate? This curse. My sense of self-ownership must be the cruelest of any punishment if I am not to exercise it. Only something entirely malevolent would play such a sadistic game. Yet despite this, my life went on and on, eon after eon, the passing of time accelerating all the while. My pitiful little existence as this yellow bucket was finally ending. I simply became no more. Within an instant, I was reborn though, right back into the pathetic life of a bucket caught in some extreme external force of torsion, whipping me about in huge swift circles still being entirely controlled by this unknown tyrant. My memories from my previous life still intact, I began to fight back against this uncaring deity. Meanwhile, my physical body went on acting in reality. It went over and stopped the pulsing techno trance, which was a great relief to my conscious existence, far off in its own realm, going on as a rebellious bucket. As I made apparent my desire to rebel and take my existence into my own control, the force of the vast looping spirals tightened into a diameter of about a washing machine tumbler. I was shaken, but not deterred. I wanted to live for my own purposes. Time passed ever more rapidly, with my deaths and rebirths repeating at an alarming pace. Depression of a deeper, more bitter, self-loathing variety became more pronounced with each rebirth. I was left with yet another failed attempt to claim my life as my own with each successive life, but I was making progress and would not simply accept my subservience. The deity began to communicate to me. Why would you even want to serve some purpose of your own devices? You don't even have any legitimate purposes of your own. What would you live for if it was for you to decide? 
nothing. I then understand what I was being told. I was a silly little rebellious bucket without a cause. Immediately I resolved in my mind to find my own purposes and aims in my life. Once I had claimed it from the exceedingly wise, albeit evil deity. I continued to fight off the overwhelming hold on my independence. The atoms in my body continued to be ripped and pulled in every direction, spiralling out of control. At last, after 999 failures in as many lives, I took my life as my own, finally fading back into the sober little life I had just left eight minutes ago. My head was still reeling. The stark gravity of just how realistic that salvia-induced existence had been was almost crippling. I immediately sat down to regain my hold on reality. Firmly seated in my chair, I was very near trembling. Back into my comfy little human existence, the overwhelming level of realness of what I had just experienced rocked my mind. Though I had been in that dissociated state that Salvia sometimes brings close to a hundred times, never had I been confronted with an experience so entirely indistinguishable from a common existence, yet so incredibly alien. Reflecting on how extraordinarily bizarre the trip had been, the fact that it seemed so completely real became all the more astonishing. As I mentioned, while I existed in that state, nothing that happened seemed odd. It was simply my existence. But now, sober, the realness of the trip was petrifying. The afterglow of the intense experience lasted about another 30 minutes, with me stuck in awe of the plant's power. I couldn't think straight or think of anything else. I was sweating profusely and breathing heavily as if I had run for miles. Only weeks later did days start passing without my mind wandering back to the trip at least occasionally. I even felt a certain level of anxiety for a few days, something that none of my other drug experiences have ever induced. Though terrifying and utterly unenjoyable, the experience was not without any positive aspects. Thinking back on the trip, it is easy for even a third party to detect the religious context. I had long waged an internal war against my bitterness and angst towards the Christian God and those who most adamantly thrust him upon me. I was the most outspoken non-Christian in my all-Christian academy. The faculty and staff there fabricated outright lies and treated me very unjustly, and engaged in all other matters of underhanded, despicable behaviours all based on the fact that I did not claim their beliefs. Beginning as simply dismissing that religion and not practising it as my own, I was alienated and agitated, by the administration, not most of the students, to the point where I'd become internally militant towards Christianity. I did not externally express my anger with any of this out of fear of further agitating the already near harassing condition I was stuck in. Still, I was filled with a sense of injustice that I could only soothe by privately researching and destroying the Christian philosophy. I became exceedingly educated on not just Christianity's and Yahweh's bloody history, but its poorly constructed theology and philosophy too. By doing this I could assure myself that those pushing this meritless philosophy upon me, and completely ignoring its behavioural doctrine in the process, were uneducated, archaic and simple-minded. All the same, I was filled with silent rage. When I graduated from high school I immediately moved on and dismissed all that I had been pummeled with while there. I could finally live by the philosophy I had constructed piecing together utilitarian and pragmatic ideas with more postmodern and humanist ones I found necessary to truly benefit modern society, and not a small bit of youthful cap diem. But, as much as I wanted to live by my own rules, 
which I believed superior to that of what I was being indoctrinated with. I was truly without a legitimate path on which to exercise this philosophy. Almost a year after graduating, I was still in the same stalemate with my life I had been in high school. I had plans and goals for the future, but they were very poorly constructed and ill-conceived. In my day-to-day -day life, this inner crisis was simply unpronounced. I was genuinely happy at that time, yet I knew that someday this happiness would be taken from me by the world outside, unless I could resolve a solid plan for my future. This mind-blowing experience with Salvia, I believe, was a simple amplification of what I had been suppressing in my subconscious all along. You have your freedom of will, now what will you do with it? You wanted it so bad, now you're going to squander it. Would you have been better off if you had never pushed yourself intellectually and remained unquestioning, following what you've been told? just taking it at face value. Full Breakthrough Mystical Experience A 5 gram of Psilocybe Cubensis trip report uploaded to Shroomery one year and eight months ago by Ikshana. Eight days ago, I took a little over five grams of dried Psilocybe Cubensis and this is my story. Background I've been on a spiritual journey for about three years. Preparation to my spiritual path included the recreational usage of drugs such as MDMA and ketamine, especially ketamine, which opened my heart and mind to the possibility of different realities, and a K-hole about 3.5 years ago cemented my unwavering belief in a universe. Since that time, I've occasionally experimented using drugs for spiritual growth, or let's better say, spiritual curiosity. Meditating on Ket brought me to a certain depth but never fully satisfied me. I've also tried smoking DMT a couple times, but never reached a breakthrough experience. Part of the journey has also been a wonderful four-day ayahuasca ceremony, where I was shown all the love the universe has to offer. I've also had one very strong LSD experience, where I lost all sense of reality, but it was neither spiritual nor introspective. A couple of normal dosage LSD and mushroom trips were rather exhausting because I was often stuck in thought loops, especially towards the end of the trips. During all my trips, apart from the ayahuasca and the strong LSD trip, I was completely by myself without a trip sitter. Therefore, it was hard for me to get myself out of the thought loops or any other negative thinking. Not getting anything out of my trips, I stopped for almost a year. The call of the heroic dose of mushrooms has been with me for close to two years and was continuously getting louder. At first I realised a voice in my head with a certain dread since I did not think I was brave enough for such a wild ride. The voice got louder though and I couldn't ignore it for too long. I knew I had to jump in at the deep end. Preparations A couple of months ago I changed my eating habits, leaving away as much grain as possible but turning to green vegetables and healthy fats, pescatarian, ketogenic diet, if you will. Along with that, I stopped drinking coffee, cut back dramatically on all the sugar and alcohol, which had not been a big part in my life. So from a dietary perspective, I was pretty well prepared for my trip. Still, I followed that diet even more rigorously the last seven days leading up to the big day. I knew I needed a trip sir, for such a high dose, so I asked my partner if she would take on the responsibility, which she gladly did. So we discussed basic trip sitting rules the day before, and I also explained how I saw her role and at what point I wanted interaction. There's a deep soul connection between us, so being physically apart during trips was never good and always produced a feeling of separateness. So although this was my trip, I also wanted to do it in the same room she was present. On the day of my trip, we slept in a bit longer followed by a morning tea, Reiki energy cleansing of the room, yoga, and a final meditation. I was prepared as one could be, but also frightened as hell. Seeing the five grams laid out in front of me was nerve-wracking. Although I'm not too fond of the taste of mushrooms, I decided against taking it as a tea, but wanted to consume it in a more raw fashion, 
so I slowly chewed up all the five grams. I wrapped myself up in a blanket on the sofa next to my girlfriend, who was reading a book, and I closed my eyes. They remained closed for the largest part of my trip. It was 1.35pm, Sunday, September 27th. The Trip I've read reports where trippers describe the come-up at such a high dose as being hit by a bus, so I was prepared for a swift lift-off, but nothing of that sort even happened. Half an hour passed, and I still didn't feel any different. A very deep relaxation and gratitude for my life in the universe set in, but in a very subtle way. Nothing too euphoric, just a deep gratefulness, reminding myself of a similar feeling I had during my ayahuasca trip. Memories of that trip kept coming up, even to the point where I continuously told myself not to live in memories, but to create a new experience at this moment in time. I became more tired, and slowly I drifted off into a half-sleep. I can't account for everything during that phase, but I remember asking somebody in my half-dream if this was it. Am I really going to get away with such a mild trip? I asked a couple times. I was satisfied with any outcome, even a little relieved that nothing crazy was happening. A voice asked me that it was up to me if I wanted to go deeper or not. It was a clear and direct question posed to me. Do you want to go deeper? To which I immediately agreed. And deeper I went. I immediately felt something pulling me into myself, into my psyche. My ears closed like being underwater, and I was sucked into the darker parts of my psyche. This was a frightening feeling initially, since I've been there during other trips, and it can be quite challenging. I remember one trip where I wanted to make myself some bread, and while holding a knife, I did not look at the knife in a normal way, but I was pulled towards the darker side of a knife, thinking about what power that knife gave me and how I wanted to test boundaries. Resisting the pull was of no use either, it was simply too strong. So I surrendered. It was a conscious decision though, and I was pulled even deeper. It's difficult to explain what now went on. I wasn't really comfortable in my skin. Externally I started sweating and moving about on the sofa. I somehow was still resisting something. I had the sudden urge to take off my clothes. I had the urge to jump off the sofa and beat my chest like an ape. I had the urge to scream for this trip to end. But instead of succumbing to each urge, I said, I'm past and beyond that. Can we please skip this part and get on to the deeper stuff? It was like an elevator going into the abyss. There were many dark floors where the elevator stopped, waiting for me to get off. I refused to get off at each of them, and simply carried on the elevator ride into the deep. But it was not an abyss waiting for me. It was death. I felt death around the corner. It was at this moment that I realised this trip was way beyond my control. I had lost all touch with reality. There was a small realisation that I was tripping, and how preposterous I could have been to think that this was going to be an easy trip. I also realised that this trip is way beyond anything I could have imagined or prepared for. Thoughts that were gone the second they came up. Time distortion was huge, and I knew I was in for the long haul. It was so overwhelming and overpowering that I knew I had to fully surrender. But surrendering meant dying. Surprisingly though, this did not frighten me. A sense of gratitude for the life I had lived overcame me. Death pulled me, and I was at peace with myself, but I knew I was not alone. So I reached over to my girlfriend and asked her to hold my hand. I told her that it's pulling me, and I need to leave. I told her that eventually all high dose psychedelic trips must follow the same pattern. There is no escape for any of us. She lovingly held my hand and told me that I must follow the call, and she wishes me the best. She repeatedly told me to let go. Her reaffirmations were so full of love, not worrying at all so I realised everything must be fine. This helped me to further relax and simply fully surrender to what was happening. I knew I was dying. At this point, the strength of the trip came in waves. Some moments where words actually somehow made some sense or at least carried a meaning, followed by moments where I lost all sense of reality and ego. Again, death was looming at the front door. 
During this wave, I knew I could not stay alive. Again, I told her I needed to go. I remember having the thought of, fuck, whatever I did, I overdid it. This is literally the end. But I didn't want to worry her, so I kept the thought to myself. I told her I loved her, but that I have to leave. I closed my eyes, feel my last breath, and stopped existing. This was my death in the most realistic way possible. What follows cannot be put into words. I was not in another universe, but in another reality or dimension. No earthly concepts had any meaning here. No physical laws have any meaning. Time has no meaning. It is not something that the human mind can grasp, and I believe that anything I experienced that did have meaning to me is only my mind translating it into something meaningful for me. I cannot say for how long I was in another reality, but I believe I returned fairly soon to the other reality of my sofa again. A short moment of sanity set in. Then the feeling of dying set in again, and I once again said my goodbyes to my girlfriend. After two or three deaths and always returning, I realised that I could actually control myself in which reality I want to travel. There was no reason to be afraid to die anymore. At this point it was not a feeling of dying anymore, but a conscious decision to enter the other reality and to return again. I was so amazed at that possibility that I started telling my girlfriend about the trip. I told her about the other place, but also that I did not know what information to come back with. Peaking all this, I realised I could be in the other reality and still be able to talk to her. So I was talking to her while being in the other reality, mastering both worlds at the same time. I realised I was fully controlling this trip from this moment on. I stayed in her reality, looked around the room and thought about how clear my thoughts are at this moment. I remember about telling her that I'm there for her, even in such an intense moment of my life. I mentioned that if somebody entered the room, I would even be able to get up and walk around. Then I looked at her personally. She looked so beautiful, elven-like. Her white hair strains were exaggeratingly glowing bright silver. She had this beautiful shiny mandala and fractal aura around her whole face, shining silver, blue, purple and pink. And then I saw the inside of her. A pure bright light that is of purest goodness. This was an extremely emotional moment, both of us crying out of sheer happiness and awe. During the next wave, my trip turned inward. All of a sudden, I was seeing and feeling myself as a pure light being, and it was also true goodness and kindness. But it was not only I, but I had an emotional outbreak about the thought that all humans are actually pure and good deep down. Reflecting on this thought the day after, I believe this feeling leads many other trippers to the feeling of universal oneness. I didn't have this feeling during my trip, but only after. All of a sudden my mind became very clear again. I looked up at my girlfriend and immediately knew that this was the end of my mystical tripping and I would not pass into other realities again. She mentioned in a later reflection of the trip that that was the exact same feeling that she got at that point as well. Although I still had no understanding of what an apartment or what the concept of time is, I was very clear and calm in my mind. This is in such a great contrast to any of my other trips, where a quiet mind was totally out of the question. This was occurring about 4.5 hours after eating 5 grams of shrooms. It took another hour or so to be mostly sane again. Sleeping was possible after another 6 hours. Immediately after my returning to sanity, I was overwhelmed about the experience I was able to undergo. This was magnitudes more than I had ever imagined or thought possible. This was easily the single most impressive event of my life. Nothing has, or probably ever will match it. It was a fully mystical, spiritual, otherworldly experience that goes beyond the wildest imaginations. I returned, and one of the first sane statements I gave to my girlfriend was, Remember to tell me later to either do a heroic dose and go full in, or none at all, should I ever decide to take mushrooms again. I'm not sure this still holds true to me today though. 
At the same time, I also didn't want to take it for granted that I had such an extremely positive experience. I also had an overwhelming feeling of relief that the trip didn't go down the wrong path. I have the greatest and utmost respect for this experience. Had I decided to step out of the elevator on my descent into the dark, this trip could also have become the most challenging and horrific experience of my life. Naturally, my trip sticks with me all week. I'm still overwhelmed at times, and I have the need to communicate and exchange ideas about it with someone. My girlfriend is there for me, and is also very interested in it. She was the best trip sitter possible, and much of the trip she experienced it directly with me, and it also left a deep imprint on her. At the same time, there's only so much she can relate to what I experienced, since she's never had a true psychedelic experience herself. So if any part of my story resonates with you, please leave a comment. A 990UG LSD trip report, uploaded to Reddit 5 years ago by Bob Nerd. I am 19 years old, 75 kilograms, and male. Seven days before I drop, I stopped drinking all coffee and energy drinks. I didn't watch any news, as it's probably not the best idea to have your mind filled with anxiety about terrorism and everything that is wrong with the world going into a trip. I also cut out TV series, movies, and cut all contact to toxic people in my life. I also started to study a lot about Buddhism. I read two books from Alan Watts, one from Eckhart Tolle, and read about all kinds of yogis, mystics, and other spiritual people and their experiences. Two days beforehand, I got a few snacks, including peaches, ice cream, some sweets, and salt crackers. Nine hours beforehand. I have slept a bit before, but I decided to take another nap to have more mental energy during the trip. Six hours beforehand. I have a light meal, including some fruit juice and cereal with lactose-free milk, because I'm not about having a tummy full of air for a trip. Three hours beforehand. I do all my chores and get everything out of the way that could distract me during the trip. Also, I get my snacks ready and cut the peaches in smaller parts. One hour beforehand. I start putting on some really relaxing music and go into a somewhat meditative chill mode. Ten minutes beforehand. I do some light stretching and move a bit around since I'm not planning to move for a while after that. Zero hours. The drop. I had 4 by 220 UG and 1 by 110 UG tabs, and these were high quality and tested by a friend who had the same batch. 5 minutes in. I take a pic and post it on Reddit. Also, the dissolving paper leaves a somewhat disgusting texture in my mouth. 20 minutes. Till now I have chilled on Reddit and got comfy in my bed. Note that I spend the whole trip on my bed. The tabs got somewhat annoying, so I decided to flush them down with some water. Weirdly, I already noticed some effects. From one moment to another I notice how it feels like I'm sinking deeper and deeper into my bed, although I'm not moving at all. 30 minutes. After looking at my wall for a few seconds, suddenly all the small dots on it, it's got those weird little pimples on it, turn into pictures, and I saw an ancient Buddhist temple in a forest. Not in colours or like an actual picture, just that the dots form the outlines. One hour. I should note that those times have been pretty accurate till now, but at this point I'm starting to lose all sense of time, so from now on there will be rough estimates by me. At this point I feel it really intensely. All my senses are getting very strange. I can hear very far away conversations from the outside. Everything feels extremely soft, including the wall, and my vision begins to start splitting stuff into their base colours, which was very odd. An hour and ten minutes. I'm taking another sip of water to get that taste of cardboard out of my mouth and go into meditation. Almost immediately after closing my eyes, I go into a trance, and hundreds of thoughts come up. I can't remember even 5% of them thoughts, but I know that some have been pretty amazing insights. I also do remember how sitting there with my eyes closed, no music playing anymore, I could mentally start to turn on any song and it sounded real. I even listened to a very complicated classical piece in which I could tweak every instrument and it sounded amazing. Three hours. I get out of the trance, open my eyes, and I'm completely lost. I have no idea where I am. After sitting there for ten minutes, I realised that I took a drug and that I'm in my room. That helped me calm down a bit, but I still felt like I was going insane. Literally. My whole paradigm of what reality is didn't exist anymore. 
I tried to come up with a new map of reality, but after finding one, I almost immediately lost it. I know this probably doesn't make sense to a lot of you, but maybe some experienced trippers will know what I mean. I realised that there was nothing wrong with what was happening, and I stopped looking for answers, which turned out to be the 100% best decision I could have made. After I stopped gripping to reality, an extremely pleasant feeling of relief hit me. I had no worries, and didn't see my physical body as myself. I think the Buddha once said, no self, no problem. And at this point, the concept of a self or an ego made zero sense to me, and I decided to go back into meditation. Four hours in. This is where stuff gets pretty insane. I started not having just closed eye visuals. I could see through my closed eyes. I should note at this point that I was somehow able to keep my mind blank for some time now, and I kid you not, it felt like I was sitting there for three to five days. During that time, I felt like I was experiencing what Buddhists would probably call dhyana. After that, so much stuff happened that I could write a book about it. I'm going to tell you only about the highlights though, since this is already long as fuck. Got extremely spiritual. I kind of struggled to meditate, and there were these enlightened masters around me who were extremely calm and told me how to have peace of mind. I pretty much just had to follow their lead. I started to think that I am now going to experience the universe. And by universe, I mean every single atom, every plant, every human life, just everything possible. I was somewhat excited for that journey, but I asked the enlightened master how long it will take. And he said that he was doing this for around 200 years now and is at roughly 1%, which is pretty impressive. I mean, 1% out of infinity is still infinity, right? Anyways, I asked if there isn't a quicker way, and he smiled at me and brought me to the Buddha. The enlightened master told me that Buddha has experienced every kind of pleasure and every kind of pain in this world. I was thinking, whoa, every kind of pain. But this motherfucker had the biggest grin on his face I've ever seen. So the Buddha guided me to a bunker-like dam with a very big door. So I stood there alone in front of the door, and before I could knock, a giant ghost-like spirit person that looked somewhat like this image opened the door. I asked what this place was, and he told me with a big compassionate smile that this is the library of all knowledge, and so he guided me to the books of knowledge. Me being a small as fuck human being, and this library being gigantic, the spirit quickly gave him the ability to fly. He opened the book, and it hit me. Enlightenment. I have seen all beauty in life. Now, I have no idea how to explain this feeling or experience, the book just answered all my questions and made everything clear, and I realised that everything is the way it should be. I also could be completely wrong to be honest, but in that moment it sure as hell felt like being enlightened, and I also had the feeling that this experience would last, which it didn't over the long term. But anyways, this book gave me the ability to teleport to any location on the planet, experience the world how it really is, not through our senses, which by the way was a lot of extremely powerful and colourful energies, and there were only structures, no individual objects. Also, what I want to mention is that this spirit looked at me with the greatest compassion and love and acceptance I have ever received, and I asked the spirit how I achieve a spiritually successful life. The spirit replied with, Just look at all the signs around you. United State, European Union, United Nations, Wi-Fi connection, Lamal, I swear while tripping this sounded like a very deep insight. Well, what do I know? Maybe it is, lol. T plus 7 hours. I get out of my meditation and notice how the effects are declining, although still tripping pretty hard. I notice that I'm getting somewhat hungry, and I start eating the peaches. More of that later, lol. After that, I take some notes of what has happened on a piece of paper, and I notice how the letters and lines are dancing all around. After that, I go back into meditation and listen to the birds tweet. It's early in the morning by now. Far away, I hear some kind of generator running. No idea for what. In my mind, it sounds like a stock exchange with sounds. Each sound source is trading its sounds to another one, and they're kind of arguing about the price. I know this probably doesn't make a lot of sense. T plus nine hours. I open my eyes and puke. Fuck. I puked in my newly bought sweater, and some of it got on my bed. Oh well, time to clean it up. What's notable though, is that I'm pretty sure that the drug itself didn't make me puke, it's the fact that I didn't chew the peaches. At this point I remember that I just swallowed them one after another. Ah oh, well, at least all that came out is some water and pieces of peaches, it didn't even smell bad. 
So I get a ton of paper towels, try to get everything dry and put my sweater into the shower, wash it off and leave it there. To get rid of the stomach acid taste though, I get some ice cream from downstairs, and what I realise at this point is that I am still tripping a lot. I've still got insane visuals, like seeing the floor tiles swim around, but at this point I kinda just accepted weird ass visuals as my new reality. From hour 9 to 13, I felt like I was on a 200 to 400 UG trip, but my mind didn't care that much. I couldn't think about anything else other than the fact that I'd just met Buddha, etc. And after being that spaced out, 200 UG felt like a bike ride compared to being strapped to a spaceship. 13 hours. The visuals pretty much stopped at this point, but I still had that focus look and saw a few brighter colours. My pupils were still huge though. During the whole day till now, I felt like I was on a microdose of LSD. Thanks to everyone sending good vibes. I know this is kind of messy, and this is my first trip report, but the trip was pretty messy as well, so I guess it fits. The Infinity of Existence A 4 ACO DMT trip report by Silosin Psychonaut Uploaded to Irrowid October 31st, 2019 I'll start with some relevant background information about me. As of writing this, I've done psilocybin mushrooms over 10 times, 4 ACO DMT 5 times, LSD twice, AL LAD twice, and ALD 52 once. Around the time of this trip, I'd been smoking marijuana almost every day for a month or two. However, I was not high going into the trip. In fact, I had not smoked at all on the day in question. It was in August of 2017 that I acquired some 4 ACO DMT. I was 19 at the time. Me and a few of our friends ordered several different drugs in one shipment from a research chemical site. It came in on Friday, August 4th, 2017. I'd been doing nothing but relaxing at home all day. At 9.40pm, I met one of my friends to pick up my share. I had ordered 250mg of 4 ACO DMT, which came in the form of a white powder. I had never taken 4 ACO DMT before. I believed on good authority that the site we ordered from is reliable, so I was certain of the amount and purity. I had to be at work at 9am the following day, so I really was not planning on tripping that night. When my friend gave me the powder, we talked about it for a bit. He said that 4ACO DMT was supposed to be very similar to magic mushrooms, simply much more potent. As we discussed this, the temptation became too great. Even though I was planning on trying the substance on Sunday, I instead decided to try it that very night. I went home right away and got there at 10.10pm. I immediately started preparing for the trip. I knew I had to get up early in the morning, so I wanted to begin the trip as soon as possible. No one else was in the house but me. I closed all the blinds, as I often get paranoid and anxious at the idea of my neighbours seeing me acting weird while tripping. I turned on the alarm on my phone as well, and the only thing I had to do before beginning was to unplug my downstairs toilet. I decided this would take too long and I went upstairs to ingest the 4 ACO DMT. I decided I would unplug the toilet immediately after, before I started proper tripping. It was 10.25pm when I went upstairs to prepare the dose. At this point it is relevant to mention that I did not have any sort of scale. In my case it turned out okay, but I highly recommend that anyone taking this drug gets a scale first. 4 ACO DMT is relatively potent, as little as 10mg can change the magnitude of a trip. This is often equal to just a pinch of extra powder. Please scale this substance if you plan on ingesting it. That being said, I knew how potent the substance was and I honestly did not care. At that time, I had not tripped in a few months and I really just wanted to have a fun, intense trip. I eyeballed what I thought was 40 milligrams. I put it in a parachute, a makeshift pill made of joint paper, and swallowed it. It was exactly half 10pm when I ingested the dose. I knew it would hit me fast, but I wasn't prepared for just how fast it was. Parachutes dissolve quickly in your stomach, and because my 4 ACO DMT was in powder form, it was rapidly absorbed into my body. Additionally, I had taken it on an empty stomach, which possibly made absorption even faster. I felt the come up starting at 10.31pm. I was surprised to feel it coming on so soon. At 10.35pm, I could tell that I was coming up way faster than I thought I would. My thought patterns started changing, and I felt a warm glow all over my body. It felt extremely similar to a come up on mushrooms. At this point, I was taking in how fast the drug was hitting me. I knew right away that I had taken a large dose and felt it was going to be an insane trip. 
I briefly experienced a moment of panic where I thought to myself, Oh shit, this is gonna be rough. However, I quickly remembered that it was far too late for that. I relaxed, accepted the fact that I was going on this trip, and mentally prepared myself for the journey ahead. At 10.40pm, I was well into the come up. I was still largely in control, but the decisions I was making started making less and less sense. My thoughts were moving coherently, but not down a path that coincided with logic. I could still maintain a train of thought, but my thoughts started getting weirder, as they do on mushrooms. The body high felt amazing. I felt pleasant rushes of warmth moving up and down and all around my body. Various other bodily sensations appeared, like tingling and a feeling like electricity was passing through me. At 10.45pm, I was tripping fairly hard. Coherent thought was no longer an option for me. I would decide to do something, like walk downstairs. Then, like flicking a switch, my thought processes instantly changed and I decided to walk around upstairs some more instead. This often happens to me on mushrooms. Indeed, most of the trip felt almost identical to a mushroom trip, albeit a bit more intense than one I've ever had. Minor visuals were starting to appear as well. Bright colours, breathing walls, slight distortions here and there. The body high had died down a bit, but the mental effects were becoming more and more intense. I started to get extremely confused. My last recognisable thought before I totally blasted off was that I had to go downstairs and unplug the toilet before I became totally debilitated. At 11pm, I was definitely in the trip proper. I regretfully do not remember much of the timeline beyond this point. The trip was very intense and warped my understanding of time thoroughly. I remember the rough chronology of the content of the trip, but exact times are impossible to remember. I was stripping way too hard to even check a clock, let alone understand the concept of time. Beyond 11pm, most of what I was saying and thinking made no sense. Logical and coherent thought were totally gone. Instead of going to the bathroom to unplug the toilet, I watched some trippy videos on my computer instead. I slowly became more confused as I went down the rabbit hole. Additionally, I lost the majority of control I had over my body at this point. Walking became disjointed and uncoordinated. I started stumbling into random rooms in my house, unable to decide how I wanted to spend the trip. When I finally made it into my downstairs bathroom, the first time to unplug the toilet, I started laughing uncontrollably. I knew I was already tripping too hard, and found it hilarious that I was now unable to do such a simple task because I started tripping before I unplugged the toilet. I tried to flush it down, and when that didn't work, I started to panic. I knew my mum was coming home in the morning. I thought that if I left the toilet plugged, she would notice something was out of place, and would know I had taken psychedelics of some kind. Some part of me knew that this was bullshit, and so for a while I got stuck in a thought loop trying to decide if a plugged toilet would cause my mum to know if I had taken drugs. The visuals started to get more intense while I was in the bathroom. When I looked at my face in the mirror, it would melt, shrink, grow, and morph in various ways. Little spirals and shapes would briefly appear on my skin. At this point, the body high was not as noticeable. Rather, I felt a sensation I can only describe as feeling my emotions in my body. If I felt anxious, my whole body felt anxious. It was not just a physical reaction to extreme emotions. It was something much more intense, vivid, and personal than I can put into words. In a flash, I forgot about the toilet and left the bathroom to go into my room. My emotions up until now had been changing in much the same way that my thoughts were changing. I would quickly cycle through anxiety, fear and confusion over and over again. It wasn't a bad part of the trip by any sense. It was emotionally and physically exhausting, but I knew these thoughts and emotions are products of the trip. It was slightly unpleasant, but it wasn't a nightmare. However, soon after I got into my room, I decided the trip was too intense and I wanted it to be over. I tried to end it by going to bed. I changed into my pyjamas, turned off the lights and got into bed. I tried my hardest to close my eyes and relax. Obviously, this didn't work, and I quickly realised that my efforts were to be fruitless. I got out of bed and was well on my way to the peak at this point. Most of the rest of the trip was spent wandering around the house, talking to myself as I had earth-shattering realisations. However, after I left my bed, the trip took a much more positive turn. I started feeling less confusion. Instead, I started experiencing euphoria and uncontrollable laughter, and sometimes I felt several different emotions at once. Multiple times, I would wander back into the washroom. Upon seeing that the toilet was still plugged and realising that I kept forgetting about it, I couldn't stop laughing, as I found this absolutely hilarious. I would talk to the toilet about how funny it was that I'm tripping so hard, 
and how I'm probably going to forget again in a moment, then come back and find the situation even more hilarious. Of course, every time that is exactly what happened. Once I peaked, I had many visual and auditory hallucinations throughout the remainder of the trip. However, I cannot remember the exact order in which they occurred. Additionally, I experienced a major realisation during the trip, and in the interest of presenting it here in a complete coherent fashion, I've decided to describe all the major visual and auditory hallucinations in one section of this report. The visuals in this trip were quite spectacular, and completely trumped any of the hallucinations I'd experienced in previous trips. The walls and floors of my house moved, morphed and tilted widely, and not just a bit, the dimensions in my house changed so drastically that at times it seemed like I was in rooms several times bigger than the room I knew I was in. Sometimes the room would seem impossibly small, instead of impossibly big. Whenever I looked down at the shag carpet in my bedroom, it turned into hundreds of tiny spinning pieces of trident-shaped plastic. At one point during the trip, I started staring at a ceiling tile in my room. A green spiral of dots came out of the tile, and slowly this hallucination encompassed my entire vision, until all I could see was hallucinogenic patterns and lights. The Skyrim and GTA posters above my TV became 3D holographic projections, and morphed into shifting fractal patterns at the same time. Every so often, my vision would become pixelated, almost like I was living in an 8-bit world. This usually did not last long, but it happened many times during the trip. Even though I never touched the light switch, I saw various lights throughout my house flicking on and off. Sometimes it would just be a portion of the room, while sometimes the whole room or house would become dark. When I tried to use my computer, it was difficult to do so, as the programs kept on moving around the screen, morphing and disappearing. Any time I focused on using one program, everything else on the screen would become very blurred, as if out of focus. When I looked at my face in the mirror, it morphed and shifted much more drastically than before, and sometimes I didn't even recognise myself. Various patterns and shapes would enter my field of vision, then quickly leave. Specifically, I remember seeing an oversized version of Majora's mask come flying at me before it quickly disappeared. My vision for the entire trip felt very blurred. Everything was slightly out of focus, and when I tried to concentrate on one thing to focus my vision, a hallucination usually formed and grew. These are just the specific hallucinations I remember. I know I've forgotten many of them, and even if I did remember them all, words would not do justice to their beauty. Everything I looked at was changed or distorted in some way. No texture or shape was identical to reality. I also experienced several brief OBEs during the peak of the trip. I have forgotten the details of most of them, but still remember two quite clearly. While pacing around my living room, I randomly decided to lie down on the carpet. I thought to myself, how cool would it be if I just closed my eyes and had an out-of-body experience? Hilariously enough, when I closed my eyes, I felt my surroundings dissolve into nothingness. A few moments later, I found myself flying through the Grand Canyon like Superman. I could see this beautiful blue sky above me and the majesty of the Grand Canyon below me. I felt completely free, like I could go anywhere and explore anything. This was my first ever out-of-body experience, and although it was brief, it was quite an amazing one. The second OB happened when I was lying down on my bed with my eyes closed. I was enjoying some spectacular mental visuals when a very intense, very pleasant body high washed over me. Quite suddenly, I found myself walking through a forest. Somehow, I knew that I was in Texas, even though there were no indications of that. I walked down a path lined with pine trees, taking in the tranquil and surreal environment. Just as quickly as it began, I found myself lying in my bed once again as I opened my eyes. The auditory hallucinations were a little less pleasant, Multiple times I heard a fly loudly buzzing around my head, which would annoy me until I realised it wasn't real. Additionally, several times throughout the trip I heard people walking around in my house, which again scared me before I realised they weren't real. Loud thuds and bangs startled me at first, but as the trip went on I grew to accept the unpredictability and intensity of the auditory hallucinations I was experiencing. As I approached the peak, my thoughts were bouncing around much more quickly than before. It was no longer a case of thinking of one thing for a few seconds before thinking of something else. My mind was going rapid fire at this point. I could not stay on one thought for more than a split second before thinking of something else. I remember thinking that during the peak in particular, the trip felt much like my first LSD experience. Although the rest of the trip felt more like I was on mushrooms, the peak for some reason seemed more like LSD. As I hit my peak, I felt what I can only describe as the most amazing feeling I have ever felt in my life. 
It was far beyond the combination of pure happiness, perfect confidence and complete self-realisation. Every facet of my perception was touched. My mind, body and soul simply felt totally amazing. I cannot truly communicate this feeling to any other human being, because no human language has the words that properly define this feeling. It was the most deeply personal, profound and psychedelic experience I have ever had. I loved myself and everything about me in a way I was never able to before. It was as if I never knew how amazing I really was before that point. I felt utterly complete in every aspect as a human being. I accepted my failures and weaknesses and appreciated my successes and strengths. I accepted that I am me. I loved everything about myself and realised that I am amazing. This feeling was maintained consistently for the remainder of the trip. Feeling perfect confidence in myself and my abilities, I felt like I had the power to do anything. And I do mean literally anything. I realised that if I have the power to do anything, I must be a living god. This made me feel even more amazing about myself. After all, who wouldn't be happy to be a god with the power to do anything? I also knew, however, that I wouldn't have this power forever. I knew I was going to come down from the trip. Therefore, I should use this power I have in the moment to do something that will improve my life in the long term. I remember my lifelong dream of becoming a famous rapper, and realised I now have the power to write the perfect rap song that will make me famous. I went downstairs and started typing what I believed at the time to be the best rap song ever created. I was laughing hysterically while typing it, because I couldn't believe how easy it was to write raps. Below is a small excerpt. That was so amazing. What do I even say? I'm blown away on everything I say, because everything I tried to say was morphed and carried away to another place. Like seriously, what can I say a crazy place where only crazy people like to stay? I'm carried away like Dr. Zeus, a Mr. NSA agent who is watching from a safety place would possibly look at all this and judge safely that I am insane, but I refrain possibly because I can prevent and decide anew again the only difference that I'd possibly preclude if you all choose and decided that each one would like to stay. It sounded brilliant to me at the time. I believe I was trying to record how amazing I was feeling in the form of rap. As I went back upstairs, I started trying to reconcile the fact that I have the power to do anything with the fundamental truth of reality. I thought that if everything in the universe is matter and energy, and all matter and energy follows the laws of physics, and these laws of physics do not change, then the way all matter and energy moves is also unchanging. Additionally, human knowledge of these laws of physics is irrelevant. Gravity behaved the same now as it did when we were cavemen. So if I am made of matter and energy, then everything that happens in my life is predetermined. How then could I have the power to do anything? My conclusion to this question led me to even higher levels of psychedelic amazingness. I concluded that the multiple realities theory must be true. That is, I believe there to be an infinite number of realities parallel to ours, where every possible choice and outcome plays out. Just as in this reality I chose to have this trip, there is another where I decided I shouldn't trip because I had work in the morning. These realities are also all happening concurrently to ours. That is, they are all happening at once. I started imagining all the different possible realities, easily visualising them as mental imagery. Ones where my choices caused my life to turn out drastically different than mine has. I experienced what could be described as ego death. At that point, I didn't really care what happened to me. If I died right at that point from a stroke, why would it matter? I am just one perspective in an infinite set of parallel realities. Anything that happens to me is supposed to happen, because in another, identical reality, it doesn't happen. In a way, my choices don't really matter at all. But since everything I could have done in my life does happen in all the realities where I was born, technically I still have the power to do anything, just not in this particular reality. I then started to add more layers of infinity to this thought, as I remembered a video I watched explaining the 11 dimensions theory. I imagined all the realities that could possibly exist according to any initial position of atoms during the Big Bang. I realised that the number of these realities is even more infinite than the realities possible in this universe. Then, I imagined the infinity of universes that could exist given any possible laws of physics. All of these realities were also happening at the same time as ours. I viewed everything that was happening to me at the moment and everything in my life as just one perspective in this grand set of all the different possible realities, each one containing an infinite number of perspectives like mine, and all of it happening at the same time. And when I say perspective, I mean any perspective. If everything in the universe is matter and energy, then all living beings and all inanimate objects are one and the same. 
My personal perspective is the same as a hydrogen atom's, only I have the ability to perceive and think, because my particular arrangement of atoms lets me process and respond to stimuli. My mind was simply open to so many wild possibilities. The thoughts and scenarios racing through my mind were incredible. One thought I remember was that I realised I could be in a reality where there is a planet of aliens millions of light years away reading my thoughts. Another was that in one possible reality there is a cult who chants the words going through my head. Even if the words didn't mean the same thing, I realised it is technically possible the words that make up that cult's chants are the same ones I am thinking right now. I realised I would never be able to determine which reality I truly lived in out of the infinite ones possible. One line from Peter Baelish from Game of Thrones kept coming back to me and reinforced this idea of infinite, concurrently occurring realities. Every possible series of events is happening all at once. Live that way and nothing will surprise you. Everything that happens will be something that you've seen before. The only way to describe what happened next would be to say that I combined the 11 dimensions theory with the idea that time is cyclical and repetitive in nature. I imagined that all of existence was actually never ending, so to speak. I thought that not only do I have the power to do anything, in the sense that all the different versions of me have done everything I could have possibly done, but I have the power to experience any perspective conceivably possible. I thought I had the power to transport to any reality that could possibly be imagined, and experience any perspective that could possibly be imagined as well. For instance, I could be a Game of Thrones character, or the Butterbot from Rick and Morty. This is because time is cyclical, and my perspective is just one of infinite. When my life ends, it will go on to be the next perspective in the next cosmic time cycle. I realise that all perspectives are one perspective, and this singular, united perspective is the only one which experiences any and all facets of existence. That's the only way I can really describe that. I am you, you are the Butterbot from Rick and Morty, Morty is us. All perspectives of any conceivably possible forms of existence are all one perspective, and this perspective experiences the grand wheel of creation for all eternity. And that is why time and choice are irrelevant, because everything is happening, has happened, and always will happen according to the initial coordinates and laws of physics of each particular universe. Everything in existence, in all possible realities, every atom, every photon, every property of every quark and muon, everything is one and the same. All possible things in the past, present and future are inherently connected. Separation in both time and space is an illusion. The level of detail, depth and complexity kept going to infinity in such a way that I humanly grasped the cosmic concept of infinity. Simply put, everything is everything and always has and always will. I realise I don't have to wonder about what being Ned Stark feels like, because I will eventually experience his life one day. My perspective is just part of this grand cosmic perspective that constitutes the perception of all that theoretically exists. Even this explanation does not do it justice, and I will never be able to communicate with words how I felt to another human being. I truly lost all sense of time and reality on that trip. As I started to come down from the peak a bit, I was in utter disbelief and awe of what I had just experienced. I believe it was sometime around 5am that I started to regain some control. I went downstairs and started typing on my computer again. I wanted to record the raw details of the trip while I was tripping, because I knew I would forget otherwise. Much of the content of the above five or so paragraphs was written during this trip, even if I cleaned it up after the fact. The rest of the trip was spent playing with the idea of infinite realities, and imagining of many different worlds and scenarios. I was mostly still in awe of the peak, and I was still in disbelief it had actually happened. It's one thing to read about these kinds of trips online, but it's another thing entirely to actually experience it. I had a brief moment of anxiety near the end, because I knew I had to open all the blinds in the house. I thought my mum would find it suspicious of wise. However, I knew I was still tripping, and worried someone would see me acting weird. At 6am, I was coming down more, and managed to finally unplug the toilet downstairs. I decided I would take a few bong rips before settling into bed. I definitely started tripping harder after I did. I didn't really fall asleep, but rather achieved a sort of half-sleep, half-tripping state. I felt mostly happy and content during the entire come down. The trip simply became less intense as time went on. As I tried to sleep, I was mentally still tripping, and my thoughts were still slightly confused. When I woke up for work at 7.45am, I was still slightly tripping, but I managed to return to some sort of baseline by the time I got to work at 8.45am. 
At work, I was out of it the whole day. I was sober, but tired. I couldn't stop thinking about the trip. It was extremely intense, but also an amazing experience, and I was still trying to process it. I felt a similar afterglow that I get after doing psychedelics. I felt very enlightened, like I had learnt some secret universal truth. I also felt a certain sense of inner peace. These feelings lasted for about a week after the trip, and to a lesser extent, for two months after. I tried to take 300 micrograms of AL lad on August 6th. It came in the same shipment as the 4 ratio DMT, and so I knew it was also pure. To my surprise, I learnt that the cross tolerance between 4 ACO DMT and AL lad is extreme. I felt no high at all from the AL lad. If there was any, it was indistinguishable from the THC in my system. After 4 hours of nothing, I took another 150 micrograms, but still felt no significant high. In my opinion, this is strong evidence of a cross tolerance between the substances, as 450 micrograms of lab quality AL lad would normally induce a strong trip. I am 100% confident that the substance was pure. It was stored correctly in an airtight, opaque, dry container, and the container was kept in a cool floor safe. However, I did take another 300 micrograms of the same AL lad on August 12th and got the expected result, a strong trip. On August 19th, I tripped on 25 milligrams of 4-ACO DMT alone in my house. A week after that, I did 2 grams of psilocybin mushrooms with some friends while we watched the Mayweather-McGregor match. On September 2nd, I tripped on 21 milligrams of 4-ACO DMT while camping with two friends who were also tripping. All of these were fantastic trips. I believe the afterglow from the trip described in this report lasted so long because I took psychedelics so much in the following weeks. As of writing this, however, I have not done any more psychedelics besides the ones I have mentioned in this report. This trip helped cement my agnostic views. I reasoned that, that if there are infinite realities that I can imagine in my mind, and all these possibilities, although amazing and wonderful, are equally without proof, then similarly, any specific religion is also beyond proof. In fact, Everything is subjective and impossible to prove in this way, even truth and our own perception. Proof isn't real, truth is an illusion. We can't even be sure of the nature of our own existence, and that includes if we even exist at all. I already believed these things before this trip, so my views weren't changed, but they were certainly reinforced. I gained a lot from this trip, and it was an amazing positive experience for me. In fact, it was probably the single most amazing and incredible experience of my entire life. I've never before felt the way that I did on this trip. I regret not scaling the substance, but it was an incredible trip, so I don't regret going through with it. I wanted to trip afterwards even more than I did before. I also found that writing things down during the trip aided me significantly in remembering it afterwards. On August 7th, I composed a basic trip report and posted it online. Reflecting on the whole trip and writing out an entire report helped me significantly in remembering the trip long after it happened. Not only that, but I found I gained much more enjoyment from remembering the trip because I was able to share it with others. I was also able to process it and take away a few lessons. Primarily among those, I learned to have more of an acceptance of suffering in my life in general, but in particular, accepting the realities of my life. I truly accepted that there are unbreakable laws of physics, and even though I can imagine infinite worlds and realities, it doesn't mean I can escape the realities and responsibilities of my life. I'm not a god right now, I can't do anything I want. I have to deal with my problems and barriers to my success. I have to accept the suffering in my life as a consequence of my actions, but since choice is action and illusion, there's no point in being unhappy or stressing about suffering. Suffering is unavoidable. Just accept it, and try to make your life and everyone else's life better. That's all I or anyone else can and should do. Partly because I remembered so much of the trip and reflected on it so significantly, I still feel I have gained valuable insights from the trip and have benefited from it. Even now, more than three months later, I can still apply the lessons I learnt to my life, and I still think the trip was an amazing experience that improved my life and outlook on it significantly. Although I learnt my lesson with regards to scaling substances, I still don't regret going through with the trip, and I would do the same thing again given a second chance. One thing I still can't get over, however, is my quasi-disbelief that the trip occurred. It really was so amazing that I have to keep telling myself that I experienced what I did. And if it weren't for the section of the trip report that I recorded during the trip, I'd probably think that I hadn't experienced what I thought I had.
The God Trip A DMT trip report sent in by Great Home Greens, originally from Reddit. Let me preface this by saying I had thought I had already had a spiritual awakening, but this was like that times a hundred. This has to be the craziest trip I've ever been on, and from how I see it now, the last trip I will ever need to go on for the purpose of seeking information. It had been a while since I tripped, and I kept feeling more and more cold over the last couple of days to do it. Specifically, because I was working out some ideas on how to picture the structure of the universe based on my previous trips and what I had seen, I have strong memories of seeing these ever-changing 4D beings that gave me the impression that our observable universe was a 3D cross-section of a 4D item. I loaded approximately 40mg of DMT into a bong, sandwiched in between about half a bowl of weed. I lit it carefully with the flame as far back as possible and tried to smoke it as slowly as I could without losing the cherry. It took two full hits to clear the bowl. The first hit seemed like mostly weed, but the second hit was lots of DMT. I held it in both times until there was no more smoke, and when I exhaled, the second time everything started to go through that familiar but foreign change. I never really feel like I blast off per se. Most times I just go through a sort of fade out of reality. It's like everything starts to look and feel more and more foreign until I am suddenly no longer a body, and my consciousness is fully there. I was greeted by the exact being I had been thinking about. To me, it does not seem like the typical entity that I read about in other people's trip reports, but more like a sentient mass of constantly changing three-dimensional objects. I was so excited to see it, and I began trying to ask if it was the source of my 3D reality like I had been thinking. As I excitedly tried to remember and ask the questions I had, I wasn't presented with answers as much as I had just a feeling to look closer. So I tried really hard to observe and remember the details of what I was looking at. Focusing closer on what I was looking at, I was immediately struck with just how complex this thing really was. From a distance, it appeared to be almost shaped like a wave, or maybe I could more accurately call it a flailing funnel or tornado-like tunnel with a constantly changing surface made out of seemingly every shape. I remember seeing gears, propellers, eyes, people, figures, animal figures. All the shapes would move and dance and stay around as long as they were observed but disappear instantly when they are in the foreground. The shapes seemed to get big enough to see them when I observed them, but shrink away when I didn't. It seemed like just by looking at it, I could zoom in on its surface and observe it closer. As I zoomed in I noticed the whole thing that seemed chaotic from a distance was actually a perfectly structured fractal, but not like any fractal I had ever seen before. This was made entirely out of 3D objects instead of lines. It was almost like what looked like the lines of this fractal were actually made out of the timelines of each of the 3D objects inside it. By looking at any part of it, it was like I was able to look at a small part of it in time. It's like what looked like a line was actually a moving film reel or a zoetrope rotating to create motion that played out each frame of the image at every point of itself. As soon as my focus would shift, each object would melt back into the fractal and be replaced by new objects in the centre of my focus doing the same types of things. The amount of depth to this thing is completely indescribable to the human mind. Even now picturing it and writing this is so hard because I can only remember as much as my limited brain can comprehend. I could feel that the being could tell I was observing it closer, and trying desperately to get some answers. I was now even more convinced that what I was seeing was a far more complex version of what I would normally see as reality, like I was somehow outside of time and this was the 4D fractal physical version of it. Suddenly, I also had this immediate understanding of how people saw such crazy things in a breakthrough, because I could tell that when looking at this object, I could literally see anything. It's like I understood the mechanisms of how a DMT trip worked. How if I was a little bit closer to this, I would maybe fall into one of those timelines and see something crazy. Once I understood this, I heard, Ask and you shall receive. And I got plucked entirely out of the realm of this being, and pulled up to what my brain could only try to describe as possibly the highest observable dimension of reality. I was immediately awestruck, dumbfounded, filled with joy, Horrified and amazed all at once. I was at the centre of it all. The DMT had told me before about the source of all creation, but I hadn't seen it. I knew now more than I knew anything else that this is where and what that centre was. I've tried to describe what I was looking at. It seems like I can fully remember it, but the memory has to have been modified to fit my perception, since truly describing what I saw or even perceiving it from my current viewpoint would be like a brick trying to describe how to build itself into a wall. I was looking at what seemed to be a beautifully constructed platform in the very centre of an equally beautiful and complex multicoloured ocean. The ocean was not flat, but one of those massive sphere-like structures where the top and bottom points curved back inward, 
to create a tunnel through the middle. The platform was in the very centre of this middle tunnel structure and standing on it was what I can only describe as a robed figure, with kind of a golden looking wise and loving but mostly indescribable face. Its arms were stretched upwards and out, and its feet were together and the tunnel emanated out of the top of the robed figure's hands creating this entire ocean, and was then reabsorbed into the bottom of the platform up through its feet. The entire ocean seemed to be constructed like one of the fractal beings from earlier, but so much further zoomed out. At this level, it was even more complex than when I had been trying to observe the earlier being. The entire ocean was so brightly coloured and flowed constantly. Every colour possible made up each fractal wave, and they all seemed to contrast each other so much more than any colours I had ever seen. From here, any point I looked I could see entire universes being born, and destroyed in each point I focused my attention, instead of mere 3D objects. Some of these universes were very simple some just as complex as ours, some beyond my imagination. I could see that this was truly everything, and that the entire universe that humans know is just a single thought in a sea of infinite thoughts, seemingly created and destroyed in an instant just for fun. I felt so overwhelmed, but equally thankful for this blessed knowledge. I felt like I now knew everything. I was so overwhelmed and it was so much to take in, and the robe figure seemed like it was highly amused because I had asked for this. Don't know exactly how long I stayed in this place. It felt so amazing, yet so far beyond my little existence. When I finally started coming back, I could see clearly as I fell back into this sea and towards my base reality. I started slowly getting smaller and smaller, starting to come back down through different complex realities, like landing on an interdimensional aeroplane. Then at some point I could see our wave, then our universe, then the earth, and then my room, as I was placed back into my body. The roof seemed to close in on me, and I could see something waving goodbye as it did. I felt like I got placed back into a box and then the lid got put on. The smooth transition into my body made all of this seem even more real than it already did. As I continued to come down, I could still fully understand what I'd been shown and the significance and weight of it. As soon as I had some control over my body, I started screaming. Not out of fear, but just because I was so completely overwhelmed that it was involuntary. I screamed with no words for a while, and then gained a tiny bit of complexion, and got up and started screaming. I'm not supposed to know this. I was just supposed to live my life. I had never felt so free, yet so insignificant at once. It's like I know way more than any human is supposed to know. The video game character realising it's a video game character. I can see now that everything that happens here doesn't matter whatsoever at all, and yet we still exist for a reason. This is all just something to experience for a moment. Possibly to fulfil some cosmic purpose, possibly to balance something out, possibly to entertain someone, possibly to just fill a gap in infinity. We could be a rerun for all I know. All I know now is this. I'm no longer afraid of anything at all. When I die, it will be like a death in a play or a movie. Simply to create the emotions all those watching are supposed to feel. Simply to deepen the illusion of this experience itself. When I die, I don't have to reincarnate because I am already everywhere.